We will now start the panel discussion, and I'm uh, going to ask the panelists, but first I'm going to introduce them. Uh, the first panelist is uh, Y.T. Cheng from the University of Kentucky, and uh, he is a professor of material science at the University of Kentucky. He has uh, BSc in physics and mathematics, and um, his role here is he is the guest editor of this issue, and his research areas are biomedical devices and sustainable manufacturing. So please come up on stage. The next panelist is Monika Backhaus, recruit from Corning. Monika is a senior scientist um, at Corning Incorporated in Corning, New York, so she will represent the industry here. She was trained as a chemist and earned her PhD degree in physical chemistry at the University of Hannover in Germany. She joined Corning after 18 years of academic research experience because before she was a research director at the CNRS in Paris and uh, adjunct professor at Cornell University and a scientist at the Max Planck Institute. She holds 25 patent applications and is credited with 130 publications. Uh, one of the examples she is giving is um, the development of porous ceramics for diesel particulate filter applications in electrochemical NOx sensors and thermoelectrics. Please, Monica, come up stage. Uh, the next um, panelist is Greg Galvin. He's also an author in this issue, and he is a chairman and CEO of a company, of actually two companies, and he's an inventor named in 58 patents, and he was named the Entrepreneur of the Year by Cornell University in 2014. He launched his first company in 1993 already, and now he is uh, still CEO, and I would like to ask Greg Galvin to come on stage. Thank you. The next panelist is Judd Reddy. He's from uh, Georgia Tech, and he's also one of the MIS Bulletin Volume organizers. He is the Deputy Dir Director for Innovation Initiatives at Georgia Tech Institute for Materials. He has been adjunct professor in the School of Material Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. And now he is, um, has a lot of prizes also. I will not read them all. And as I said, he is the volume organizer for the MS Bulletin. So please come up stage. And then the next panelist is uh, Suresh Babu. He's from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of Tennessee. He is also an author in this issue. He obtained his PhD degree in material science and metallurgy from the University of Cambridge as well. And um, his work has been on both basic and applied research. One of the topics is 3D printing. He is using computational material science and computational and multi-scale characterization tools. He is a fellow of the American Welding Society and has also a lot of awards. And please come up stage, Suresh. Um, so, and then, of course, I would like to ask the speakers to be uh, members of the panel. So, <laughs> Colin, would you please uh, come up again? Julia had to leave, and Teresa also, I uh, presented her already. So, she should also be among the panelists. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> we heard all your talks and opinions. You come from different worlds from academic world and industry and some of you have both experience and uh, now is the question um, to you 
what is the most important part or what comes first, material or uh, application. And I, uh, we are, can do it in the following way. Um, you can ask questions and if necessary, I will repeat them and uh, address it to one of the panelists. So please, do you have questions to the panel? So if not, then uh, maybe I'm, I'm asking uh, you first, uh, Monica, so you are coming from industry and uh, so what is your opinion? How much basic research do we need on materials or is it better to find a patch for your problems? <laughs> So typically it's a pretty tight uh, connection between both development of the materials and the technical application. So, and it's something which goes hand in hand over a long time. Because typically the first pitch of a material is unfortunately not the best one. <laughs> so basically there's a first material, there's a development of a first technology, a first process as well, and then basically step by step, loop by loop it goes on. And I think this works probably best together with those inventors of the material, which means in many cases universities and research institutions, and basically someone who will really do the mass production of the material afterwards. If there's a startup company in between, it should be always something, basically collaboration all across the different levels from the fundamental research up to basically engineering and production. That would, for me, be the most efficient way. So as a basic researcher, this is, of course, um, very um, tricky to do so because we always want to work on a breakthrough. Maybe uh, you, you have an answer to, to this uh, idea of Monica. Do you have a remark? So the question is uh, whether you want to focus on basic research or engineering. Is that the question? The, yeah. That, that's, so I think I would kind of twist the question as I would say the interface between the fundamental and the engineering is the most important. So in either way, you can translate the basic to uh, apply it quickly. So we used to do that quite, quite often very well. And then as the things progress, so it's departure quite a lot happens. So a lot of people in the interface area between the applied and the basic is reduced. So we need more of those people so that they can translate back and forth. So as explained by Colin. So, so this interface person would be the CEO who's working for free, or what is this now, interface? I would say, actually, Colin actually acted as an interface here. So if you remember his talk, clearly that he could negotiate the deals and everything. Still, you won't call it CEO, but I really enjoyed that talk. So. Okay. Yeah, but you said that you were not a good choice as CEO. <laughs> Um, no, I think that I think I just didn't have the experience of running companies. So uh, you know, if I, if I run a few more companies and I might well, get involved with a few more, I might be. That's right. But I think I think for a CEO, you do need someone who has developed a successful company, got a track record, and then bring that person on board. I see a lot of students in the audience, and I think it's uh, very important for them to take at least one business class while they're taking their scientific and engineering classes, because if you uh, when you get out, you may go to industry or you may go to academia. If you go to academia, you're essentially running your own business, uh, writing proposals and developing a product, which may be a proposal or some uh, peer-reviewed paper, or the students, yes, as well. Um, but having the ability to speak both uh, the scientific language and the business language and serve as an effective translator between those two worlds can um, really help your career, I think. So do you agree with this statement? Do you really want to do both, being a good scientist and also understanding something about money and business plans and so on? Do you think it's a good idea to have both? Yep, yeah, please. I think that's a really good idea because in the end you're trying to contribute to society and you're doing research on a small scale in the lab and if you do not know how to put this out there, in industry, for a large-scale application, if you don't know how to, how should I say, move towards a patent, move towards these um, production processes which make your small product into a large product, then yeah, I think indeed it is 
necessary to also know the more economic and yeah, more the business aspect of, of science, actually. So I do agree with that. So in my university, we're basically obliged to take a course like this because they do value and appreciate that aspect very much. So I do agree with that, yes. So uh, I have a different question. So yes, okay, sorry. <laughs> many researchers from academia see applied research as a dirty word. And so uh, you have a lot of really smart people that are, that are discovering a lot of new things and have a lot of uh, uh, knowledge. They can contribute to some of the problems that industry has or industry would like to pursue. Um, we used to do this better way back when. Um, how, how do you see us doing that better in, 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 in making a bridge between industry and some of the fundamental research that, that people are doing and not thinking about applications? Yeah, Teresa. So I think it's very important for industry to have close ties with, you know, some set of universities so, so they can see what's going on, but more importantly, provide input on what the important problems are. I think even though many faculty are only interested in the basics, they still have a, a choice about which direction to look in. And uh, so uh, it's up to you to sort of say, look, there's something interesting over there. And that's the first thing. The second thing is, I, I think, at least in the US, companies have gotten used to all the basic research being taken care of by the government, and, and that's increasingly untrue. And it may be untrue for the topics that you care about. So, so there has to be sort of engagement and, and building of collaborations and, and, you know, not huge exchange of, of resources, but some. And, and I think that's how people get interested. One of the key challenges I see uh, on a daily basis is um, most academic folks, if they want a research grant or research contract, they want that to last three years or so, so that you can get your student well enough along that uh, they'll graduate. Um, three years is forever on an industry time frame. Um, they want more like six month or 18 month type contracts and research efforts, and that's uh, really scary for me to bring in a graduate student and put them on this effort that I know is going to last a year, maybe tops. Um, what happens at the end of the year if I'm no good at my job and I don't have follow-on funding? I don't want to turn, you know, I can't fire my student, or I guess I could, but I'm not going to. Um, and, and so it just, learning how to have a I guess a diversity of staff, so postdocs can really work very well on the six to 18 month time frame um, and, and, and team with the graduate students as well as the undergraduates um, to get the different efforts uh, forward. Yeah, it's a very good idea to work in a team so not everyone has to do everything. So please, you have another question. Yeah, I recently moved from a national lab to industry. So what I see is a conflict between the metrics in which academic or national lab research is weighted, that is papers and publications, whereas in most industry it is by quarterly profits or something, which are totally diametrically pu pulling their research apart. And I think there needs to be more bridge between those two in terms of some reasonable metrics which would bridge this gulf. Thank you. Steve had a question, okay. So maybe first, uh, yeah. Gopal decides he has a microphone. <laughs> I, just wanted, I just wanted to respond to your point. Okay. In academia, it's actually not three years. It takes closer to four and a half or five years to get a PhD out. But I'd argue that we do research at exactly the same pace as they do in industry. A graduate student has a very non-linear output. Nothing, 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 nothing. And then they do everything in the last six months and they get just as much output in that time. And education includes preparing a student and preparing the human capital. So it is amazing that that's how it usually works. And I think it's important to say that, so. Yeah, that's true. May I add a few yes, things please. to this yes. discussion? Uh, I worked in industry for 20 years before I became a professor. Uh, to me, I don't see a clear boundary between basic and applied research. I think it's a continuum. Uh, in terms of how to improve education, uh, my students are supported, uh, co-supervised actually, with uh, 
a co-advisory industry, and they they work on problems that e of immediate interest to industry. And then uh, it ter I think uh, it, it, by doing that, one can cover both applied aspects of the project and also look into the fundamentals uh, at the same time. Okay. Uh, okay sorry. <laughs> Next yeah. question, please. Yeah, I think as a follow-up to uh, some of the earlier co uh, comments, um, in uh, basic research in the universities, very often you have absolutely no clue what your product will lead to. Absolute none. And if we look at uh, the development of uh, some of the things we take for granted here, we find that in the days when they were studying it, they had absolutely no clue as to what will happen 20, 30 years from now. So even the five-year time scale often is so small. I mean, if we look at you know, all the technology, the, the uh, cell phones and all those things, you know, it took you know, decades for the basic work to be done. And I think we have to recognize that as we you know, think about, 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 about applications and how to uh, uh, you know, make sure that we don't lose that. But I'd say also there's a, another distinction to be made. You know, in, I agree with the concept that basic to applied is a continuum. But when we talk about basic research and commercial output, we're often referring to you know, a fundamental discovery that then ultimately became a major commercial success in some fashion. And if you look historically at fundamental new discoveries, they tend to take about 30 years to mature into a real significant commercial reality. And 30 years is even worse than <laughs> five years on the industrial time scale. And that's typically three venture funds' lives before anyone starts to make money on it. So that, you know, basic research where you're trying to better understand the actual mechanics of how this thing deforms is different than basic research of a fundamental new discovery that generates a whole new industry. And I think that's something very important because one of the key roles of the universities in material science, physics, and chemistry is to create this fundamental knowledge and provide the maximum of learning of materials, new structures, and designs to have something like a big rubber boat around materials and new inventions because it's basically this fundamental knowledge which helps afterwards to understand and build new materials. And that's one of the key roles of universities. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, I think um, in US uh, you are uh, at a good point where you really have a collaboration between uh, basic scientists and people working in industry, but uh, I think in other parts of the world this doesn't work yet so well. I think about Europe, at least where I have been uh, doing my research experience up to now. Uh, they are encouraging us uh, in, at the university to apply uh, for uh, uh, funding together with the industry. But in my experience, the industries are kind of waiting to see that uh, we at uh, the university produce good results they can use and commercialize. I don't see really, I don't know if you have uh, other experience, Anke, I don't see really a collaboration between uh, the two. How can we improve this collaboration? Yeah. Okay, uh, let me take a crack at it. So in uh, US, in National Science Foundation, they have a program called Industry University Collaborative Research Center. It's called IUCRC. So this is what it really does is a franchise to bring industry, academia, and government agents to have a communication. So more than the technology, so you need to have a credibility, you need to create a trust with them. So before, a money comes as a membership from the industry to fund it. So in fact, the IUCRC, NSF puts a very little amount of money. The most of the funding comes from the industry. But that requires the faculty to talk to the industry and then understand their business need and then translate them to fundamental or applied science need. That way you can have develop a credibility and trust worthy with them. So most of people who are here have done that in the past. So, But it is the one which I would always say that first thing is handshake and say rather than professing about 
your expertise, you need to listen to what their problems are. So that is the first and foremost. I'll stop. Thank you. Is this um, answering your question a bit? <laughs> is this uh, can I, yeah. can missing? You're also that, European, yeah, please. Just, just to say that um, um, in the UK, uh, some big companies like Rolls-Royce that have detailed collaborations with universities and they set up what are called university technology centers and some of the Rolls-Royce centers are in Europe and, and some are in America, I believe. Um, and uh, that really works very well. So the Rolls-Royce person and the university people, they discuss joint projects together and they get something which is a mutual interest to both parties. Uh, but from both sides, it requires a lot of, lot of work. It's a lot of time. So it's much easier to be an academic that doesn't talk to industry than to be an academic that does talk to industry. And so that's the culture we really need to develop. And, and the, the same for industry. You know, industry needs to develop a culture of talking to the academics. And then both, both parties can benefit. The, uh, I, I would echo what Colin said. It, it's work. It's very hard work. <laughs> but but one, one thing that does unify uh, industry and universities often is, is the advanced instrumentation that universities have because companies, you know, not every company wants to own that instrumentation and they don't want to employ the people to use it and, and maintain it. And so, um, so, so building on instrumentation is, is a good way of, of making that interaction or initiating that interaction. So to capture industry partners, you have to show your expensive equipment. Please. And competence. <laughs> well, so I'm a uh, graduate student that will soon graduate, and I'm thinking to forward of when I, I'd like to be an academic and start my own lab. And I've been really impressed with this coming down to you need to have that communication between the lab and industry. How do you go about starting one of those types of communication, or how do you start that communication? Places like this. Um, <laughs> okay. It's it, all about the networking. Um, you may not realize it, but you started your networking several years ago um, by presenting your work at, at symposia and writing papers, and, and that's essentially your advertising, if you will. Um, and you just slowly make friends, and, and those colleagues may be in academia. They may wander over to industry or back and forth to national labs or wherever. Um, and just as your network builds and people learn your capabilities, you get friendly introductions. Um, there's also, at least uh, in Georgia Tech's case, we've got a very active alumni base that is, uh, Georgia Tech turns out the most engineers of any U.S. institution, so we've got spies all, all over the place. Um, and those spies identify problems throughout their industry, and they come back and they talk to their old professors, they talk to their old schoolmate chums and whatnot, and... Um, and we listen. That's the most important thing is to be a listener, but you need to be a quick listener um, because, again, it's the pace of industry. It, 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 they really uh, operate at a, my experience is that it operates at a much higher level than, than academic type folks because they don't have spring break that gets in the way and final exams and other things that kill off productivity for weeks at a time. Yeah, I, I would absolutely echo two of those points. Um, I, although I'm representing industry here, I also have heavy engagement with Cornell. And, you know, the accessing the alumni base is just incredibly valuable. And I would say one of the largely overlooked opportunities for making connections. And then the other would be kind of the inverse of your question. I was asked to serve on a panel of uh, mostly life science postgraduates who wanted to not go into an academic career and had kind of been predestined towards that path all the way up to that point. And they asked the inverse of your question of, okay, how do I not become an academic? And the answer again was networking. And one of them who was there emailed me afterwards and she's now working for my company. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. So may, may I ask, uh, add on to that? One of the things as an, a graduate student, you should experiment. Next time when you are on the flight, next door ask a person, where are you, where is he working from? If he knows from industry, make a pitch about your research, how it relates to them. Believe it or not, I did once and then had a project with that. Very good. Uh, I completely <laughs> agree too. about that. The, the, uh, the, the socialization uh, 
you know, we're coming up on the holiday season, so there'll be a lot of party opportunities typically to go to and standing around mingling uh, with folks. Well, what do you do? It's, I'm a material scientist, and they just sort of look at me and so how about those Braves? They're signing a good pitcher next year. Um, so to be able to convey your science in a, uh, a meaningful way that, that resonates with the common man or woman um, is, is very important. Uh, I always, I was just up in Chapel Hill where I'm from having thanked him with my mom. And she doesn't care one lick about my peer-reviewed papers, but she's very, very interested in the solar cell technology we've licensed. She always wants to know how that's coming along. She doesn't care that I'm drafting a terribly difficult paper to write. Okay, but we have another comment from the I have a, a new audience. question to ask. Okay. Um, <laughs> you do know that the federal government uh, has requested funding agencies to require PIs to, um, to make their data and their research op open access to the public. And so as we struggle to do this um, with respect to data management plans or, or handling data, there's a, there's a great opportunity there for learning how to use that data in new ways to learn new things. Um, but also, uh, there's the problem of, of sharing that data. How, how do those, those two conflicting ideas affect the relationship between academia and industry to move forward in a productive way? So well, the, the federal actions that you're discussing typically apply to federally funded research as opposed to industry funded research. So industry is very, very uh, close to the vest with the, the IP and, and whatnot. It's, that's been my personal uh, experience. Um, set the rules of engagement up front so that there is no surprises as you're moving forward with the project, okay? They are open to sharing some of the data as long as it's uh, pre-competitive. Pre-competitive and you say process A, process B as opposed to explicitly delineating out the, the secret sauce of an of a industrial application. There was one other comment from you? No? Okay. I, I would say that, that the open data issue is it, it's complicated because um, a lot of time nobody wants to host the data, right? So, so the uh, the journals, the publishers are all doing experiments, if you will, on data and how to share it and how to keep it. Uh, the MRS is worried about this. I think there is a data session maybe right now or yesterday mm -hmm. at this time. So. So it's, it's evolving quickly, I would say, and it's not clear where it will end up, but uh, I'm pretty sure it'll be a better place eventually. Thank you. More questions, remarks on this issue? Steve. So I'm just curious, since we have these amazing people up there, about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, we saw the total collapse and demise of the industrial research laboratory. Bell Labs went away, IBM's all but gone, Xerox, Exxon are all gone, Westinghouse is gone, and yet here we are continuing to innovate and create new materials and new products. How have we gotten away from that? Do you think that that was an essential thing to have those industrial research labs? Um, are we just in a gap where they did enough great work that we're still living off the fruits of what they did? Or do you think we're going to be in a crisis soon because we don't have such an endeavor? Because the governments, while they continue to fund, the total amount of funding you know, is still gone way down compared to what we used to have with those worldwide treasures, I would think. So how is it getting done? And how is it going to get done in the future with that gap? Is it going to happen at the entrepreneurial level? It's not happening in industry, right? You know, they're not doing that kind of research that Bell Labs or IBM or Westinghouse used to do. So maybe that asks the question of how valuable is basic research. I've always contended it's wonderful as a training ground for human potential. Um, but I still remember when I was a postdoc at Bell Labs, my boss telling me, there's wonderful problems out there that are all basic research. Why not work on something that might be useful? And we all did apply basic research, and that's what we did. So I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Well, you probably, being from Bell Labs, read the book, uh, The Idea Factory. Uh, I won't read it because it's too depressing. I'm, I it, is, it, it. it does not end well. You're right. It's, it's, it's pretty exciting, good plot and character development, but at the end, it's kind of rough. Um, but 
I do recommend that, that you read it and, and have some tissues with you when you do. Um, but it's very uh, insightful because it, it describes exactly what you're saying. And I think the role of a lot of those have been taken over by uh, academic institutions. For instance, Georgia Tech has what's known as GTRI, Georgia Tech Research Institute, which is the applied research arm. And I've got a joint appointment there. So I, I, it, it, it's like having a foot in academia as well as industry at the same time and allows me to hop back and forth. Other places have Lincoln Labs and SRL and, and a variety of different um, uh, quasi-academic labs that are, that are grounded in the basic science because that's fundamental to everything but also have an eye on uh, the application and, and the future. Um, it's, as Teresa was mentioning earlier, that the, the federal government is, is, seems to have, everybody has ceded the, that the federal government will, will fund the basic research, and that is going away. So if we're not careful, we'll lose our seed corn and the whole crop. But I, I'll take a little issue with some of your comments. I largely agree with it, but if you look at some of the companies you mentioned, IBM, Xerox, I mean, they still have multi-billion dollar annual research budget. They're, they're still doing a lot of research. It's not what it was 30 years ago. But also, if you look at most American corporations, they're nothing like they were 30 years ago. And I think the generic answer to your question is all activities have been distributed. And so the, the whole research enterprise is much more distributed across types of institutions and across geographies. I mean, the, the gallium nitride that was mentioned earlier came out of an academic lab and is now growing into large new corporate activity. It didn't come from the guys who were making light bulbs before. <laughs> it didn't come out of the corporate researchers who you would logically have thought might be doing that. And so I think we just, we see research innovation occurring in lots and lots of different formats and, it, and it's not in the you know the four big corporate labs that it was 40 years ago comment I mean I mean I, the corporate labs are still there right I'm more familiar with the car industry General Motors Ford they all have research labs in existence even at this MRS meeting we have met several car companies making presentations in on topics like lithium-ion batteries so uh, in fact, the students, they're still hiring PhDs. Uh, one of my first PhDs now hired by the car companies. So, so, Steve, I think part of it is that the world has changed a lot, right? It used to be that the, the thing that was so special about Bell Labs was the way that people interacted in a very interdisciplinary way. And that just didn't happen at universities at that time, right? So, so at universities have become much more interdisciplinary and and from the company end it's much easier for them to interact with academics than it ever was you know just fire up the Skype and find out what's going on so I, th I think they just all the, the the ways of communicating have changed enough that you don't need one giant research lab sitting oh. physically somewhere you misinterpreted I wasn't making a statement I was asking a question and I think the answer to the question is probably that we don't really need those big former huge basic research labs. I think, and I was just asking, how is it going to move on in the future? Because I think we've hit a whole new way of doing things. And I'm not sure we've recognized really where the strengths are coming from. And that's what I wanted to ask. What's going to happen in the future? That's what this is about. And I, I the, the central research and development things are going down. They're still there, sure, but they're a fraction. But I, I don't think I'm not bemoaning their absence. I'd just like to know where we're going and how we're I, filling I think you, you have one model for that in the life science world where the large pharma companies, which once upon a time ran $40 billion central research operations, have all but abandoned it. And the model is entirely little startups, high risk, funded by the venture community, try the risky science, when it starts to look like it's, there's promise there, they get bought by the big pharma who can put it into the distribution and commercialization path. And it's just completely altered the m drug discovery model for that industry. Whether that happens in the physical sciences, I don't know, but that's one example. And it seems like everything in society is going to the distributed model, and I, research is no different. I think, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think that there's 
plenty of good ideas scattered all across the globe uh, that can be capitalized upon. There is a one resource uh, which uh, across the U.S. you have a DOE national labs. They do work with industries too. So in fact, they come and do a lot of crater with them. So indeed, those are the resources which you can use them. And uh, across the board, we have a lot of them. So bringing universities industries together, they could be the nexus of them. Thank you. Other further question, please. Uh. So um, I recently became a postdoc, and uh, I'm also president of a small company that we based uh, we started based on some IP we developed in our research. And we're trying to find funding, and navigating the landscape is a little overwhelming. And we were pursuing some SBIR grants and some goalie funding potentially, and then we're also pursuing partnerships with companies that already do federal research, as well as some companies that uh, just produce products, like we do aerospace materials, so Boeing and things like that. And so it's hard to identify where we want to focus our efforts. And I was just wondering if you had any advice, someone getting started, what is sort of the best bang for your buck, if there is such an answer in that. Are you geographically fortunate in that you're located near the Bay Area or Boston mm -hmm. or other sorts of areas? Because there's definitely uh, areas where venture capitalists and angels uh, tend to roost a good bit more. Um, Georgia is not really one of them, where mm -hmm. I'm from. Uh, it's, it's growing. Uh, we're getting more of that that uh, environment, but most of the investors in Georgia are more interested in real estate as opposed to carbon nanotubes. Um, so uh, that, unfortunately, at least from my perspective, seems to be very, very important. Uh, even though I'm in Atlanta and you can get to Atlanta Hartsfield from anywhere, it's only a few hours from, from the Bay Area. It's a giant chasm uh, uh, between there. Yeah, that, that Geography plays, unfortunately, a huge role there. Central New York is worse than Atlanta. Uh, we have managed to rank last every year in total venture funding in the country. But the answer is really, there is no one answer. It's all the things that you mentioned. It's back to our soon to graduate person's question. It's all about networking. I mean, we, we say that there's lots of money in Silicon Valley, lots of venture firms, and there are there's also all that much more competition for their money, their time. So I may have seen many startups leave Cornell and say, oh, I'm going to go out to the Bay Area and get funded, and they don't get funded. Because it, at the end of the day, funding tends to be all about who do you know and how can you establish credibility with the people who have the money. And they, that's all about networking and perseverance. Uh, I but before I came to Georgia Tech, after graduating, I worked in industry for big business and then worked at a small business doing SBIR. And, uh, that's really a great program. Uh, the phase ones are, and for those that don't know, it's SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research. It's a funding mechanism. Um, and phase ones are challenging to, to do. Um, that the, the money allocated for that, that effort is really usually not enough to actually do the effort. Um, but it's good seed to, to get to the phase two, which actually does tend to be enough. And then if you're even better than that, get into phase three and commercialization is a way to go. I, I'm a big fan of the SBIR um, program and S, STTR is its uh, evil twin cousin. Yeah, I may add to this point that uh, you, you may want to be a big fish in a small pound. Uh, Kentucky is probably one of the poorest states in the country, but we do have a one-to-one -one match to SBIR. If you want the SBIR, we, the state government will provide one-to-one -one match, both uh, uh, stage one and stage two. He speaks the truth because of the mm. small company I worked for up and left uh, Atlanta for Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since the state wars are on, you are welcome to come to Tennessee, yeah. uh, please. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of opportunities in the nexus of the UT or in LY12. There is a lot of focus on small business innovation. A real tangible example is my grad student who started, worked with me started a company called Aliterra. So right next door to Oak Ridge National Lab. So uh, if I could just say one last thing, Jonathan, and he's fortunate to live in California. Um, I, I think it, Colin said this actually. It, it's sort of a matter of convincing people that you're almost there, right? Because it's so much easier for them to invest in software than in hardware and real materials. 
And, and so certainly in the Bay Area, it's a much more distributed model, right? When you start a company, you, you outsource everything. You, you don't do anything on your own. It's like you said, you have an office and there's nothing there. And so convincing them that, that you're almost there and, and you don't need many resources, whether or not that's true, <laughs> seems to be part of the problem. Yeah, the, again, the development timeline is exactly right. The materials is you tend not to have that m magical breakthrough that six to 12 months later, you've got this product that you can put a barcode on and start selling. So one of the things which is often missing, I think it's good to have networking and have the right contacts, but it's very important as well to have basically in an early stage already a cost model and in the cost model a variation of different parameters and inputs to basically see where are the key drivers for your product, where are the key obstacles. And sometimes you figure out maybe it wasn't really your invention, your material, but it's some kind of sidestep. And typically you would know how to address that, but if you go now and sell your product somewhere, they would look at it and say, this does not work, it's too expensive at some point. So I think it's, it's very important to do this kind of exercise, uh, exercise around cost modeling very early just to be able to address obstacles and basically have a nice proposal. Thank you. Yeah, definitely do your homework with uh, the customer engagement, whoever's going to ultimately buy your product, um, know what they're wanting for it. We're developing a, a medical technology and as we started talking with uh, nurses and, and um, other practitioners at, at hospitals, they identified a whole new area that, that our product could be used for training, that they spend a whole bunch of money training um, that we had never, we, we were just going to prevent infections. But there, there's just an area that we didn't even know about until we started talking uh, really in depth um, over beers and you buy them dinner and stuff like that and that's just called overhead. Maybe I'll add to this point. I think this is a really important point, distinguishing academic research and industrial research. Rarely a material is used just because of one attribute. It's a multiple attribute in the material. Initial performance, durability, safety, and cost. And academic research often is fo only focusing on one and one fashionable data point that can get people into high impact journals. Whereas industrial research, you have to simultaneously study a number of parameters, including cost. Yeah. Academics never focus on cost. I can vouch for that, for sure. Thank, Thank you all very much. Are there other comments, questions to the panel? So uh, do we really find great ideas, great breakthroughs when we are thinking about costs? Is this really the conclusion? No, you find the great breakthrough just you know, through our own curiosity and everything, it's, it's coming up with clever ways to make that breakthrough uh, viable in the real world. Okay. So the real entrepreneur, first of all, thinks about customer need. What is he trying to? So for example, the one of the example is, what is a human need? What do you like to focus on? That may be pretty expensive when you start off. Probably if you think about one iPhone you created, maybe a million dollar. So how it makes an impact, you have to focus on. The cost is not there, first thing. Thank you. So I have really some sympathy for the energy sector, and I have worked <laughs> for many in many different projects around energy. And there's, for example, a very large difference, since we come back to cost, <laughs> uh, in the energy sector in Europe and in the US. So in Europe, the government supports research initial uh, industry efforts to basically develop new materials, new systems, new designs, whatever it is, to, to create green energy. However, in the US there is not such driver, it's just the market competition, right? And so many of those actions which could be taken have to be driven by, uh, by laws. So once the laws are established, Basically, industry can come in and say, okay, we can work in these areas. But before, while we don't have actually 
a legislative um, decision to drive uh, some new laws and regulations, it is almost not possible to do so. While in Europe, I think the governments really provide a lot of money to, to drive it in that direction. And I think this is an area, the energy sector, where work in Europe is much, much easier between uh, research, universities, uh, government labs, and industry than it's in the U.S., for example. Yeah. To my large regret. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So there's a... So one of the things about if you're in academia and you build up skills, you build this hammer and you, you look around for nails. And so it's straightforward maybe to get funding if you can make, uh, if you can make it seem like you found a nail. But that may not be true. So are there any funding mechanisms if you found a real nail but you don't know what the hammer is yet? Okay, uh, let me start off with, uh, when I finished my PhD, I was very I was very happy I came out and Professor Badisha said, that's right, you just got a driver's license. So that means what you learned in the PhD is how to analyze the problem and how to go about solving the problem. It is not one hammer you have. You have the ability to do multiple hammers and multiple tools to go and solve an engineering problem. So that is the most underlying principle what we have to learn from the first point on it. So then comes listening. The one of the things is about understanding the, each other's problem and being sympathetic to the, what their problem is. And then coming up with sometimes you may not have a solution, but your colleague next door will have a solution. Go drag him out for a beer or something and then figure out how to fix the problem. So that is the best way to go about it. So that's my suggestion. The multidisciplinary aspect that you just mentioned is, is crucial. I think all the uh, solutions that require just one little skill set are solved at this point perhaps and that all the, at least in my opinion, all the future very difficult problems really require a material scientist, an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, a, a, a computer scientist to work collaborat collaboratively as a, as a team um, to solve that and I've certainly never in my experience had an easy time with funding. I think the average tends to be about 10% hit rate for, for most people's proposals and, and whatnot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, if there are no more questions from the audience, is uh, there something you want to say and you didn't say now? There is one area which has not been discussed. Is there is a new generation of students and everybody. They are actually, it's called maker community. They are not waiting for us. So they are going and innovating. They are thinking about it, totally different ways of going about it. So sometimes if we can get their enthusiasm instilled on us, wow, that would be the future. So think about it whenever you have it. So there are so much of tools you have it readily available. I wish I can go back and do my PhD right now. <laughs> so that the, t the information is right there. Only thing you need to know is how to ask the right question. Yeah, the, the, the concept of makerspaces is uh, a, a great invention. And if you don't have it at your academic institution, you need to start banging on department chairs, doors, and, and those sorts of things. And, and make sure that she's got one, so it's, it's no trouble. Um, but to make sure that those assets are available to you to allow your creativity to to explode onto the marketplace or into the journals, wherever it may go. Okay. Oh, I, I just want to use the opportunity as uh, one of the volume organizers of the special volume uh, to thank the other uh, volume organizers, editors who are not here, uh, Dr. Arun from India, Banerjee from India, and Professor Jim, Will Jim Williams. And also uh, Gopal, uh, MR staff, University, uh, Cambridge University Press. Of course, the authors and the reviewers, if you are in the audience, if you're not in, uh, thank you all for uh, contributing to this volume. Okay. So, 
Paul will give the last words, uh, but I would like, before he's coming up and summarizing, I would like to thank you all for your time, this nice discussion, and uh, good questions from the audience. And uh, yeah, hopefully we will <laughs> have big breakthroughs soon with this collaboration. Thanks, Anka. Yeah, so just a few closing remarks. I mean, um, I was really struck, no one really asked to challenge the basic premise of, of the uh, issue, that is the interplay between materials and engineering. And maybe it's a little self-serving, because if you're coming to this conference, you probably fundamentally believe that materials have something to do with uh, improving, the, uh, improving life and uh, pushing on engineering. But, you know, I, I think that is a fundamental truth. Uh, there's plenty of history that shows that uh, materials and engineering have played together. I know in the industry that I'm in, uh, electronics right now, because of the um, growth of information technology, finding, getting copycat uh, technology for products that you make is happening faster and faster. So there's a huge pressure to keep differentiating your products so you can charge a little bit higher prices, get higher profit margins. So industry really, really does new, need new technology. New uh, materials into, does enable a lot of that. As struck by Teresa's comment about materials equal risk, for sure. I think uh, Having worked in both uh, startups and big companies, one kind of rule of thought is that every time you scale the volume by a factor of 10, you discover some fundamental flaw that's really going to kill the product, and you have to overcome that multiple times. In those cases, having the fundamental knowledge of how the system works, how to tweak things to overcome that, or just persevering and, and pushing it through is, uh, is really necessary. So I think an ecosystem of basic kind of yeah, sort of uh, translational and applied research is really necessary for this, uh, you know, for this uh, balance between materials and engineering to continue. So, anyway, good discussion. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the MRS for sponsoring this special issue, and thank you all for coming. Yep.